Our steeples drown the cocks. You sulphurous and thought executing okay. fires. Hold it. Board. Co- Don't Hold you drop me there, John. I'm in full flight now. No. I'm just enjoying myself. No, sit you, you down, oh. and we're going to talk about that. Oh, you sit it's you down good, there, wasn't it? <laughs> well, now, passion, pain, and extremes. That's what we're going to look at tonight. Most questions about acting Shakespeare are questions of balance. If we go too far one way, we need to restore the balance and go a bit in the opposite direction. So if, for instance, we do start overdoing the heightened language a bit, it may be healthy to take the speech or scene in question more naturalistically and not to relish the words quite so much, or vice versa. What I want to look at tonight is something we've touched on already, how we should balance the emotional and intellectual demands of the text. I said in our last program that we should be venturing now into more subjective areas. But I'll try to be as selective as possible and to look at the problems which relate peculiarly and chiefly to Shakespeare. You can, of course, find them in other dramatists, but I don't think in quite so concentrated a form. What did Shakespeare himself think the balance between passion and coolness should be? As it's generally agreed that he was expressing his own views when he has Hamlet advise the players about acting, let's listen to that advice once again. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But you must... Oh. Try it again. <laughs> I'll start this again. Try it again. I'll say it to you if you like. <laughs> trippingly. Trippingly, thank you very much. Right. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as um, many of our players do, I'd as leaf the town crier spoke my lines. Nor uh, do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus. I never did that. (laughs) But use all gently. For in the torrent tempest, and I may say whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Trippingly on the tongue, mouth it. Gently, in the very whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that will get it smoothless. Well, it's pretty clear where Shakespeare's sympathies lie. Hamlet does ask for what we'd call coolness in playing passion. But he, too, is aware that there must be a balance. Be not too tame, neither. But let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. With this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. Yes, I think the key phrase here is, or step not the modesty of nature. This is Shakespeare's way of saying we must be natural and not false or grotesque. So let's explore this balance now and see how far we should go. There you go. Shakespeare often builds his characters by creating deliberate and striking inconsistencies. Very often, a character undergoes huge changes from speech to speech in the course of a scene. In Julius Caesar, where Brutus contemplates Caesar's murder and meets his fellow conspirators, his emotional and intellectual balance keeps on changing. He's volatile and he's variable. He prides himself on being cool, but how cool is he and how much of a mixture? Let's look now at four speeches. The first is a soliloquy. It must be by his death. And for my part, 
I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general he would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder, and that craves weary walking. Crown him, that. And then I grant we put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affections swayed more than his reason. But tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face. But when he once attains the utmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend. So Caesar may, then lest he may, prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing he is, fashion it thus that what he is augmented would run to these and these extremities. And therefore think him as a serpent's egg, which hatched would, as his kind, grow dangerous and kill him in the shell. Rational, exploratory, intellectual. Brutus is feeling his way and deliberately pushing down his feelings for Caesar. He's trying to justify himself, to elevate himself, kid himself. But a little later on, we get a glimpse of his true feelings. Since Cassius first did wet me against Caesar, I have not slept. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion, all the interim is like a phantasma or a hideous dream. The genius and the mortal instruments are then in council, and the state of man, like to a little kingdom, suffers then the nature of an insurrection. This betrays his inner turmoil, but Brutus puts his unease into brooding generalization. He still doesn't speak directly of his personal human feelings. But when the conspirators come to visit him, he's assured and very much the public man. And when Cassius urges them all to swear their resolution, he opens out. No, not an oath. If not the face of men, the sufferance of our souls, the time's abuse, if these be motives weak, break off betimes, and every man hence to his idle bed. So let high-sighted tyranny range on till each man drop by lottery. But if these, as I'm sure they do, bear fire enough to kindle cowards and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women, then, countrymen, what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? But do not stain the even virtue of our enterprise, nor the insuppressive metal of our spirits, to think that or our cause or our performance did need an oath. When every drop of blood that every Roman bears, and nobly bears, is guilty of a several bastardy, if he do break the smallest particle of any promise that had passed from him, can you hear how different the verse is here? It's rhetorical and ringing and more regular. Brutus lets his emotion out because he feels on safe ground. The speech is to be hot, as his first speech was cool. Later, he has one other long speech to the conspirators. It's triggered by Cassius urging that Mark Antony be assassinated as well as Caesar. Our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius, to cut the head off and then hack the limbs like wrath in death and envy afterwards, for Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let us be sacrificers, not butchers, Caius. 
we all stand up against the spirit of Caesar, and in the spirit of men there is no blood. Oh, then that we would come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar, but alas, Caesar must bleed for it. And gentle friends, let's kill him boldly, but not wrathfully. Let's carve him as a dish fit for the gods, not hew him as a carcass fit for hounds. Great. Now stop it there. Now here, Brutus seems to me very emotional again. But there's also something of the rationalizing and self-deception and elevating of murder which we saw in the first soliloquy. He's at great pains to stress his humanity, but how much is he humane and how much a politician paying lip service to humanity? How much is he emotional and how much is he working on the conspirator's emotions? Well, I suppose it's a bit of both. He's using his feelings to work up feelings in his listeners. What do you think? Well, all those um, hypotheses that you just posed, all those questions, are, are I think, the, the, the very source of Brutus's dilemma and his energy. And he must actually hand those uh, questions over to an audience. Uh, that is the predicament of the play. Um, and on first reading, of course, Brutus seems to be fraught with contradictions and um, what's your word for it? I, I, I ambiguities. Used ambiguities, contradictions, things that are set uh, antithetically against one another. And if you, um, in any line or, 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 of course, often Brutus's finer lines are only a microcosm of the whole part and indeed the whole play. If you try and iron out the inconsistencies, the contradictions, in order to make the line playable, what you're doing is, in fact, anesthetizing the energy within the line, uh, because the energy of the character, the predicament of the character, is only available to an audience if, those, um, if the tension between the opposing forces is observed, relished, and played. Mm -hmm. But, of course, it's, I mean, that's all theory. It's very, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to, to um, spread eagle oneself inside the giant silhouette of Brutus and remain faithful to all these seemingly contradictory elements, but they have to be played to the full. Well, the character, in a way, is the contradiction. Is the contradictions. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks, sir. In stressing these particular points, I don't mean to gloss over the obvious fact that there are many possible ways of interpreting a speech. Shakespeare, more than any other dramatist, leaves it all pretty open-ended. So let's take a sonnet which lends itself to many kinds of emotional interpretation. Sue, you're talking about your sex life. See if you can look at it in three quite different ways. There's your bed and your lover is coming. <laughs> The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action until action lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, <laughs> cruel, not to trust, enjoyed no sooner but despise it straight. Okay, <laughs> right. Now, let's try another way at the moment of suspense. Let's imagine that you've done it <laughs> and you're getting dressed and getting out of bed and deeply being disgusted with yourself at what you've done. Right. <laughs> I am disgusted with what I've just done. <laughs> well, enjoyed it. <laughs> the expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action, until action lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, enjoyed no sooner but despise it straight, past reason hunted, and no sooner had, past reason hated, as a swallowed bait on purpose laid to make the taker mad. Okay, good. Now, 
both those versions were extreme in their emotions. Good. But now let's do as we've been doing with the other speeches in the program. See what happens if you stand outside yourself and have a good, wry, sardonic look at yourself. So the experience of what's happened, what you've just done, is there deeply in you, but you're trying to look outside yourself and perhaps to mock yourself. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. Until action, lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, enjoyed no sooner but despised straight, past reason hunted, and no sooner had, past reason hated, as a swallowed bait on purpose laid to make the taker mad. Mad in pursuit and in possession so. Had, having, and in quest to have extreme. A bliss in proof. And proved a very woe. Before, a joy proposed. Behind, a dream. All this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. Good. Well, there you had the characteristic Shakespearean mixture of deep experience and feeling and yet standing outside it as well. And once you do that, the text begins to do more work, whereas the first way is, of course, you're overlaying something on top of the text. That's the point of the exercise. Now. Let's make an experiment. It's sometimes pointed out that if an actor gets himself too emotionally involved in an emotional speech, he will actually move the audience less than if he was less carried away. If he actually weeps, for instance, it may flatten out his voice and somehow cut off communication. So let's take one or two speeches and see what we think. Sometimes the balance between thought and emotion goes wrong because of an excess of naturalistic thinking. In Henry IV, part one, Hotspur and Prince Hal fight, according to the text, a long hour by Shrewsbury clock. So clearly they must be pretty exhausted. But finally, Hal gives Hotspur a mortal wound and Hotspur has a dying speech. Let's see what happens if the actor plays it with his exhaustion <laughs> and his wound and his pain primarily in mind. That's what I'd call the naturalistic fallacy. I'm just getting into that. <laughs> getting into emotion, feelings, and pain. But of course, the text gets strangulated and cut off. Often happens. We know actually that Shakespeare himself wants to do something else with a speech, doesn't we? Because Hotspur himself says, they wound my thoughts worse than thy sword my flesh. And that's quite a useful piece of direction by Shakespeare. I think that Hotspur's anguish is in the mind at that moment rather than his body. Well, pain's relative anyway, isn't it? I've, I've known an actor fracture a bone on stage during a fight and, and not feel the pain until he gets off. It depends what you're concentrating on. If I've, as Hotspur, determined to put my life in order, as it were, before I die, that will supplant the pain, won't it? That's, That's right. My mind will be so one can always find a psychological or naturalistic reason for doing a speech in such a way that you right. can release the poetic juices of it. Yeah. So let's do it again, N not necessarily feeling the pain, but feeling the wonder of, God, what's happening to me? I'm dying. Yeah. And take a clue from the fact that you prophesy in the speech. Right. robbed me of my youth. I 
better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. They wound my thoughts worse than thy sword, my flesh. But thoughts the slave of life, and life's time's fool, and time that takes survey of all the world must have a stop. I, but that the earthy and cold hand of death lies on my tongue. No, Percy, thou art dust, and food for text can work upon us and stir us, which you can't do when the physical life's on top of it. Of course, these things are always a balance, because maybe one got too cool then. But Absolutely. actually, but, yeah. I was more moved that way, obviously, than I was the first time. Yeah. So jolly good. Thank you. I think we've stumbled here on one old problem of a speech which is partly choric. So let's look now at another passage where the choric element is even more striking. In Hamlet, Gertrude brings the news of Ophelia's suicide. Notice how she says nothing directly to show her feelings. The speech rather consists entirely of description. There is a willow, grows aslant the brook, that shows his hoar leaves in the glassy stream. Therewith fantastic garlands did she make of crowflowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples, that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There on the pendant boughs, her crowned weeds clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke and down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide, and mermaid-like a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes. Or like a creature native and undued unto that element, But long it could not be till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. I think you're absolutely right to keep Gertrude's feelings in check like that. Clearly, the choric function is dominant, but it's still quite possible to ask and find out what Gertrude is feeling and trying to do inside herself while she speaks. What do you think of that? Well, I think uh, there's probably a great deal of guilt there. Yes. Because uh, indirectly, uh, I think she probably feels she's responsible by the actions that have taken place previously for this girl's death, whom she reveals in the next scene she loved very much and hoped would be the wife of her only son. Um, and uh, I think that is probably struggling inside her all the time, plus the knowledge of the uh, appalling death that she has to bring to this young man who is an innocent party in the whole affair, so far. That's right, so there's a hell of a lot of subtext going on mm. underneath, mm. inside, which you can play as Gertrude, while on the surface just playing the description. Mm. So both are mm. going on. Mm. Very good. Mm. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, here's a fearfully difficult passage for a woman. In King John, Constance laments for her dead son, Arthur. There's no doubt here about the degree of her passion. Oh, that my tongue were in the thunder's mouth, 
Then with a passion would I shake the world. Now, let's take the passage, much cut, and see what we can learn from it. Patience, good lady. Comfort, gentle constant. No, I defy all counsel, all redress. But that which ends all counsel, true redress. Death, death, oh, amiable, lovely death. Thou odoriferous stench, sound rottenness. Come, grin on me, and I will think thou smilest and kiss thee as thy wife. Misery's love, oh, come to me. Oh, fair affliction, peace. Good. Now, I think that the question of variety comes up here as much as the question of balance. Constance is distracted and wild, but it's dangerous if you take the whole passage that way, because the grief could become monotonous or generalized. So let's see what happens if we say, go as far as you like in some places and hold back in others. I think probably that's the way Shakespeare's written it. Yes, I think her, her striving for order, um, in that she in fact puts into a list form her, her feelings, um, seems to indicate the amount of control that she has. And um, I think that Shakespeare's O's are uh, some indication um, of, of emotional reliefs. Yeah. I, I found this, this question. Well, that's very good counsel, yeah. Shakespeare's O's. Yeah. I think that one other thing that I would say is that it's important that however distressed you are, one bit of her enjoys the speech in the sense of enjoys the emotional release so that she needs the words yeah. to give herself release. So use the words as ever as much as you can. Okay. Lady, you utter madness and not sorrow. Thou art not holy to belie me so. I am not mad. This hair, I tell, is mine. My name is Constance. I was Geoffrey's wife. Young Arthur is my son. And he is lost. I am not mad. I would to heaven I were, for then tis like I should forget myself. Oh, if I could. What grief should I forget? Preach me some, preach some philosophy to make me mad, and thou shalt be canonized, Cardinal. You hold too heinous a respect for grief. He talks to me that never had a son. You were as fond of grief as of your child. Grief fills the room up of my absent child. Lies on his bed, walks up and down with me, puts on his pretty looks, repeats his words, remembers me of all his gracious parts, stuffs out his vacant garments of his form, then have I reason to be fond of grief. Say you well, had you such a loss as I, I could give better comfort than you do. Oh Lord, my boy, my Arthur, my fair son, my life, my joy, my food, my all the world, my widow comfort and my sorrows cure. Good. Well, the feeling was all there, but because you took it lightly, the words and the language worked on me as well as the feelings. Yes. And, and they, the feelings didn't get between you and it. Yes. I could have. I think I could have inflected more and had more variation. I got a bit stuck in the uh, in this bit. Well, we never think it's perfect, <laughs> do you? Certainly you not. move me. Yeah, good. good. <laughs> Now, let's go back to a speech where there's no doubt whatever of the emotional intensity of the speaker. Lear is going mad, he's on the heath in the storm. Donald, take us back to the speech which we began the evening with. Blow winds and crack your cheeks. Rage, blow! You cataracts and hurricanes spout till you have drenched our steeples 
drowned the cooks. You sulfurous and thought-executing fires, vault couriers of oak-cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head. And thou, all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world. Crack nature's molds. All Germans, spill at once that makes ingrateful man. Okay. Well, if you do it as flat out as that in a small studio, it's a bit like it's a dinosaur odd, sitting on a teacup, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. But I must confess, Still though, off. that I don't quite know how I think this speech should be done. Part of me does question the full-blooded busting a gut version which you were going for, but I'm not sure. It could be, however, that... When you do it like that, it's an overlay on Shakespeare rather than a realisation of the text. It seems to me that, as ever, the text could do a great deal of work if your emotions don't get on top of it. You would like me to do one over the top, then? No, I no, thought... No. no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think the roof and the lights and the cameras would stand it, actually. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll try an exercise and an experiment. Don't bash it this time. Just breathe it. Whisper it quiet as you can. Don't, don't try to shout the storm down. Just imagine that there's a dip in the storm and you're out of breath and you're very, very old and you haven't got a big voice. And remember Hamlet's advice to the players. What was that? Speak, <laughs> speak the speech trippingly on the tongue, but if you mouth it, if you mouth it, I just leave the drowned crier spoke my lies. Have a go. You know, I must admit, I, I, I do think here that uh, Lear is asking for a storm, actually not commenting on one that's already there. Good, good mm. counsel. Blow winds and crack your cheeks. Rage, blow. You cataracts and hurricanes spout till you have drenched our steeples, drowned the cocks. You sulfurous and thought-executing fires, vaunt couriers of oak-cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head. And thou, all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world. Break no... Oh. Never mind. I, I yes. Thought, I thought Crack. that you were getting much more richness both of feeling and of text out of it than when you brought the roof down. Yes. It was a strange experience for you, wasn't <laughs> it? <laughs> well done. done. Lovely. Good. Thank you. Let's have a look now at Mistress Quickly describing the death of Falstaff. And we'll do it first in the same way. Be very moved and carried away by what you're seeing. Oh, all right. Ooh. <laughs> all right, then. Yes, yes. Wait a minute. Would I were with him, where Sir Mary is, either in heaven or in hell. Nay, no, he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom, if ever man went to Arthur's bosom. And made his finer end, and went away, and he'd been any Christian child. <laughs> it passed in just between twelve and one. <laughs> you know, the turning of the tide. For after I saw him fumble with the sheets and play with flowers and smile upon his fingers' ends, I knew there was but one way. Oh, yeah, that's enough of that, don't you? Right. <laughs> um, OK, well, tried it that way. Now, hold in your feelings because they're so painful. They're still there, but you hold them back and try describing exactly what it's like in Falstaff's bedroom, exactly what it was like to be there. Would I were with him, where Sir Mary is, either in heaven or in hell? Nay, sure, he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom, if ever man went to Arthur's bosom. And made a finer end and went away and it had been any Christian child. He parted in just between twelve and one, in at the turning of the tide. For after I saw him fumble with the sheets and play with flowers and smile upon his fingers' ends, I knew there was but one way. 
but his nose was as sharp as a pen. And I babbled a green field. Oh, now, Sir John, quoth I, what man be a good cheer? So I cried out, God, 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 three or four times. So I, to comfort him, bid him he should not think of God. I hope there was no need to trouble himself with such thoughts yet. So I bade me put more clothes upon his feet. I put my hand into the bed and felt them, and they were as cold as any stone. And I felt up to his knees, and so upward and upward, and all was as cold cold as any stone. Lord, well, you moved me quite a lot there. There's no doubt, is there, which way works the better. I suppose that it brings up another point which we've made before. How much is the speech about Mistress Quickly and how much is it about Falstaff? Well, obviously it's about both, but my experience of it in the theatre is that the balance is often wrong. The speech becomes a bit too much about Mistress Quickly and her grief and her sentimentality and her tears, but the actress has to make a C full staff on his deathbed. So perhaps the moral is that it's sometimes more important to make the text resonate than to be moved oneself. But these are rather dangerous words. I sound as if I'm suggesting that an actor given half a chance will always tend to indulge his emotions at the expense of his text. Well, that does sometimes happen. But on the whole, I believe that the main reason the balance goes wrong is something quite different. It's very often simply to do with the size of the theatre. In the rehearsal room, a small area like this, he can work quickly and lightly, and it's much easier for him to maintain the balance. But when he has to fill a big auditorium, he naturally feels he has to project and make both his voice and his emotions bigger. And of course, he's right. But very often, he loses something thereby. So in our present context, a small, intimate studio, we don't have the pressure of a big space to fill. So let's look now at this difference. Lisa, do the speech of Portia when she's finally getting Bassanio because he's chosen the right casket and go absolutely full out as if you were in the big theatre at Stratford. How all the other passions fleet to air as doubtful thoughts and rash embrace despair and shuddering fear and green-eyed jealousy. Oh, love, be moderate. Allay thy ecstasy. In measure reign thy joy. Scant this excess. I feel too much thy blessing. Make it less for fear I surfeit. Good. Now let's bring the camera very close and see what happens if, like Donald, you just breathe it, whisper it. How all the other passions fleet to air as doubtful thoughts and rash embrace despair and shuddering fear and green-eyed jealousy, oh, love, be moderate. Allay thy ecstasy. In measure reign thy joy, scant this excess. I feel too much thy blessing. Make it less for fear I serve it. Lovely. Well, now, what do you feel about those two extremes and possibilities? Um, well, the first one, you just need to, uh, express the huge joy that she's feeling and also the release of the enormous tension. I mean, the tension of years, I suppose, of waiting for this casket to be chosen and the right one and the fact it's the right man. So therefore, you have to use the language to push that emotion up and out because it's actually one huge, great sigh, isn't it? One huge cry of joy and of uh, also amazement. Um, so in, in the huge theatre, you'd use all that outwardness, all those... The, the words to push it out, to push the emotion out. But when you're in a small space, you have to... And because it's an aside, he's actually written aside, um, and, and you're very close to the person who's playing Bassanio, you'd have to bring it right in, contain it, um, and, and you would be able to whisper it. You'd be able to say, Oh, God, I can't bear it that closely, which you couldn't possibly do in a big house. Which do you prefer? Hear. Well, obviously, as a, a, 
I would prefer the, the latter, yeah. um, but mostly we have to do the former. Good. I think most actors would say the same thing. Now, I seem to be coming down rather strongly on the side of cool Shakespeare. If so, it's not because I'm fighting shy of the emotions, but because I believe that it's the way to make a scene or a character or a speech more moving. What I'm saying is that Shakespeare's language could be made to work on an audience as powerfully as an actor's emotions can. That, at least, is my experience. I don't mean that the actor shouldn't have emotions, but that they need to be channeled and controlled like the rest of his performance. Thought, emotion, and text must be balanced and in harness. But in a poetic play, the text should surely be the prime thing which is working on the audience. Now. Hamlet is, I suppose, the supreme example of a part in Shakespeare which is an intense mixture of passionate feeling and intellectual and intense thought all the time. That's the balance. So go for it in this bit. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. What is a man if his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed a beast no more? Sure he that made us with such large discourse looking before and after gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused. Now, whether it be bestial oblivion or some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event, a thought which courted hath but one part wisdom and ever three parts coward, I do not know. Why, yet I live to say this thing's to do, sith I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. That's great. Because you gave us the thought and you gave us the feeling and they were both intention and balance. But I've said enough about that. You tell me about it because you've played Hamlet and you know more than I do. This speech seems always to me very much like somebody going down for the third time. Um, it comes at a point in, in the line of the part where uh, Hamlet's life seems to have spun more than ever out of his control after a bewildering series of catastrophes in which he's become an exile and a murderer, but of the wrong man, at a point at which his assumed madness and his real disturbance are the, the border between them has become very, very shadowy indeed. And it seems to me to be a final attempt to assert his capability and godlike reason in an attempt to, to understand the, the, the volcanic emotions that he feels. And uh, he hangs on, as it were, by his, his finger's ends. Uh, now, Hamlet's finger's ends are his exceptional ability to, to rationalize and reflect on his emotions. And you could say that that um, saves his reason, though it ultimately destroys his life. Um, so that he makes this attempt and comes up against uh, a sort of a blank wall, which is these four extraordinary lines of monosyllables. I do not know why yet I live to say this things to do, so that I have cause and will and strength and means to do it, which are like a sort of banner headline that come blazing off the script yeah. at an actor who's, who's, again, scanning the text looking for, for clues. And what is very interesting indeed is that um, the need of the actor to control um, a flood tide of emotion and discipline it uh, mentally and technically, uh, using the essential eye of the needle, which is the language through which and only through which that emotion can be, 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 be fed, um, coincides in a very peculiar way with the character's need to understand and rationalize on his emotions. So that not for the first or the last time in the play, um, the borderline between actor of Hamlet and the character of Hamlet begin to coincide, and a truly theatrical metaphor is set up. And the borderline between passion and coolness, our theme, 
That's terribly intense and locked together here, isn't it? Yes, because I mean, a lot of the language in the plays is terrifically wrought and elaborate, and it is possible through an excess of feeling to distort the language instead of working through it. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. Let's end by looking at a passage which, to me at any rate, is one of the most moving in the canon. We can't do it full justice here because it's much cut and it needs the theatre. But let's just have a look and listen. At the end of the winter's tale, King Leontes thinks that he's killed his wife Hermione. And for 15 years he's been grieving for her. But she's actually still alive. At the end of the play, Paulina presents her to him as if she was a dead statue. <clears throat> a fairy tale situation, a thing full of wonder. I like your silence. It the more shows off your wonder. But yet speak. First you, my liege. Comes it not something near? Her natural posture. Chide me, dear stone, that I may say, indeed, thou art Hermione. Oh, thus she stood, even with such life of majesty, warm life, as now it coldly stands when first I wooed her. I am ashamed. Does not the stone rebuke me for being more stone than it? Oh, would I were dead. But yet, methinks, would you not deem it breathed, and that those veins did verily bear blood? The fixture of her eye has motion in it, as we are mocked with art. I'll draw the curtain. He'll think anon it lives. Oh, good Paulina, make me to think so twenty years together. I could afflict you, father. Do, Paulina, for this affliction has a taste as sweet as any cordial comfort. Still, methinks, there is an air comes from her. What fine chisel could ever yet cut breath? Let no man mock me. For I will kiss her. Could my lord forbear? You'll mar it if you kiss it. Shall I draw the curtain? No. Not these twenty years. Either forbear, quit presently the chapel, or resolve you for more amazement. If you can behold it, I'll make the statue move indeed, descend, and take you by the hand. What you can do, I am content to look upon. But to make her speak, I am content to hear, for it is as easy to make her speak as move. It is required you do awake your faith. Then, all stand still. For those that think it is unlawful business I am about, let them depart. Proceed. No foot shall stir. Music, awake her, strike. His time. Descend. Be stone no more. Approach. Strike all that look upon with marvel. Come, I'll fill your grave up. Stir. Nay, come away. Bequeath to death your numbness. For from him, dear life redeems you. You perceive she stirs. Start not. Her action shall be holy as you hear my spell is lawful. Shun her, lest she die again. Present your hand. It 
when she was young, you wooed her. Now, in age, is she become the suitor? She is warm. Thank you.